life in a Cambridge junior high school can be bitter and unfulfilling. The school day is short, and when the bell rings at 2.30, there may be little more to do than hang around and wait for dinner. For a few fortunate young people, however, things have been different. In the early winter months, a group of students from Harvard's Phillips Brooks House set up a theater workshop at the school and put on a production of a musical comedy. This is a document of the time they spent together here at the Longfellow High School. Like I'll, someone will ask me, you know, where do you hang around, or, you know, where do you live? And I'll say, near Longfellow, and kids will say to me, oh, Longfellow, you know, I've heard about that place, except it's really, you know, a lot of the times it's just so quiet, you know, it's really quiet around there. A lot of them say, oh, there must be a lot of trouble down that neighborhood. It's like talking about Northern Ireland or something. They must think, oh, you get your house broken into all the time and your car stolen, they think the neighborhood's really bad, but it isn't as bad as they say it is. People around the school there, right away, the first sign of anything, they'll call the police. You know, like people see, people can see the police cars and stuff like, you know, things like that. I think that's what upsets everybody. I really didn't have any particular um, uh, strength or, or experience in, in, the, in, the, in drama other than just, you know, being being uh, somewhat of a of a, a fan of various kinds of, of theater, but the uh, I came down and hung around with the kids for a while at the teen center and saw that they all they did was the girls came down to watch the guys sit around watching the girls, you know. And I saw that the, the, the kids were hanging around, they wanted to do something to show off, and I thought it would be nice if they could get some kind of confidence in their own talents because they were all very insecure too. And so I suggested that the thing that would pull them all together, that would give them a chance to get together, to socialize, and to show off to one another, while developing confidence in, them, in themselves, yeah. you know, and while, while getting some kind of pride in something they work together on, would be a play. So I suggested we did a play. We'd do a play. Cliff Green and Jeff Melvoin joined forces in directing the production. The show they had chosen, Bye Bye Birdie, was a hard one. The task ahead of them was complex. Because the show dated from the early 60s, kids felt uncomfortable in their parts. The show's score also presented problems, extending beyond the vocal capabilities of the cast. Like Jeff and Cliff and everybody, that's, they always made the chorus feel really important. Well, they are, you know, they are. Um, I played the part of Rosie, and she, she was the secretary of the songwriter, Albert, and he worked for Conrad Birdie, and she was in love with Albert, and, uh, you know, and she was, like, really upset, because all, he just wanted to write, he was interested in write, writing songs, and at one time, he wanted, he was going to be an English teacher. And that's what she wanted them to be, and, she, and that's what she was upset about. Uh, with, you know, she was interested in getting married. I think you know that's what she was. That was her goal. It 
if we didn't do it right, like they'd tell us what they thought we did wrong. Cause like, say we were watching on the stage, we couldn't tell what we did wrong. If they watched, watch what we did, and they saw what we did wrong, and they told us, and we put it. You go, Because he's really nice. He really is. Like he's just like my father. If I do something wrong, he hires at me, and he fixes me up, you know, to do it right the next time. And the same directors, like they take you just as the part, you know, like say Ravna, just as Sam. But like Cliff and Jeff, they take you as the person, what you can do, and as the part, and they like sort of compromise it out. They wouldn't really tell us, but they'd correct us if we did it wrong. Like, that's what you need. You need someone to correct you. That's how you can get a show off. There was an occasion in the show where Walter had to learn a song called Talk To Me. And in the original production, it was done with a male quartet in the background, and it was very lush. And I rearranged it for a single guitar and, and worked it out and taught it to Walter and I learned it almost as, as we were doing it together. delinquency, and vandalism have long been problems in the Cambridge area. All segments of the surrounding community are affected. A full-time janitor talks about damage done to the Longfellow School. Well, we got the girls' room in the foyer. It was painted about a year, maybe two years ago. You see it today, you wouldn't think it was ever touched. There's markings all over it. Broken rules, you can't, you can't keep up with them. Mm -hmm. Some of them are accidental, I, I'll admit that playing ball in the gym, the ball does break some of the windows. But others are not accidental, they're purposely done. I've been working at Broadway, Snack and Child, for almost two years. Uh, well, it seems to me well, there's been a quite a number of uh, windows broken. Uh, in the last, as far as that I know of, uh, in the last three years since Tom has owned the store, something like 22, but during the whole time, it's, it gets to be kind of expensive, mainly because it's 200 and some odd dollars plus, you know, installation and retaping, and, and then not even that, you know, most of them are broken late at the night, you know, one, two o'clock in the morning, and just recently had a fire where it wasn't like some papers were lit up in front of the, the little doorway in front of the door, and that was like 2 o'clock in the morning. How much? Well, I got blamed for $3,000 damage to the school. And after that, I just said, I ain't going down there no more. You know the stone, the stone walls, the big pillars with the pineapple on top? Well, we pushed one over. Went right over. How many of you did you take to push it over? It took two kids. It was ready to fall over anyway. So I think it was better that they did push it over than have it fall on some little kid. Do you sometimes feel that, that uh, if you'd been a, a janitor here and your own boy was, was going to the school and, and you saw him doing some of the stuff that kids around here do, would you? Would well, make sure that he didn't do it, I'll tell you. If I were 
a parent of any of the kids in the Longfellow program, I'd view him or her with much more ambiguity than I did as a director, uh, or as any of the staff members had to view them. We had to look at the kids as individuals, and we tended to ignore a lot of their basic weaknesses in order to bring out their strengths. Um, as a parent, in other words, you'd be forced to look at more of what goes on all day with these kids, where we had to be concerned only with how we were dealing with them, and then perhaps get to another stage. Um, this had, you know, we didn't get to this view right away. We had a lot of problems in the beginning deciding how to deal with with the kids. Um, we didn't know anything about about the school or about the kids, or uh, even about our, each other in, in this early staff meetings. Um, we were quite probably suspicious and, and wary of each other at the beginning, much less the kids. Um, and so it just got to the point where there were so many uncertainties uh, that if we'd stopped to really intellectualize about them, I doubt that any of us would ever have made it to Longfellow School in, in the front door. Uh, but luckily, we didn't have time to intellectualize about it because the time came for us to start working with the kids, and we just went. I didn't want the pot. I, I don't know. I just, I was really, I was really nervous about it. I didn't think I could do it, but then everything worked out okay. She was older, you know. She was grown up and everything, and and just some of the pots she had, you know, she, just her character. I didn't think, I, I didn't think I could do it. And that was a good number. There were some other ones where the dialogue is a little flat. Like, for example, Larry. One of your big problems is you got your dialogue down so early that now you're beginning to, to regress. You're going back to a stage where, you know, it's not at that peak. You've got every single time you give your lines, it's as if it's going to be the best time. You're not trying to recreate something you knew two weeks ago. Well, I think I was just up there and act like a big dummy. And everybody else would get all the lines to try to make a fool out of me. Chase had me doing all these movements that, you know, <laughs> I always, you know, couldn't do them, you know, like a broad would do them. The audience is paying to see you for the one time only, and they deserve the best you can give them. They don't know that you've done this a thousand times. As far as they know, they don't care. All they care about is what they see, and if you blow it, the nights that they're there, they don't give a damn how many times you've done it right. They don't care if the final performance was better than the Friday night performance if they were there that night. All they know is what they see. And they have a right to judge on what they see. It's not enough to say, well, these kids are just doing it as a social thing, and so we can't expect that much out of them. That's bullshit. We've heard some old folks. We've been with some a couple weeks before the show. And, um, I mean, the whole thing went wrong. Where's Larry? Larry. Larry? Larry? All right. Or, or you could say, Rosie, I need you. She hasn't come on. You could just go, oh, Rosie. Yeah, well, just, I want you to start heading off. But if you, if you get to the edge of the stage before she's called you back, well, I'll start calling you Terry. Where's Terry? <laughs> Terry, just come out. <laughs> Where did Terry just go? <laughs> Let's see. There's one, two. Where are the other ones? Terry? Anyway, that looked, that looked really, really excellent. Yeah, it looked good. Um, hey! Quiet. I don't want people running around. Just have a seat. Missing in most everything else that happened. Because it went on every day. It was really smooth. It just lacked excitement. Slowly, tentatively, the show was put together. Cliff and Jeff were torn between merely providing a constructive after-school activity on the one hand and assembling a professional piece of theater on the other. Mary Amato, head of the Longfellow Community Schools program, talks about the range of after-school activities which are currently available to students. Most of the kids seem to spend their free time just hanging around. Uh, activity ranges from sort of sitting around and smoking and talking in after-school to uh, 
drinking at night for a lot of beer cans that you can find in the morning. Supposedly there's some fairly heavy um, drug abuse that goes on in the area. There's a high rate of car theft, auto theft in the area. It seems to be a focal point for that to some extent and also just for, for the younger children to, to have a place to meet. These kids don't have anything to do. They have a teen center which doesn't even exist. And, and what does exist closes down at 9 o'clock on Fridays and Saturdays. So what are you going to do if you're a teenager? Are you really going to go home at 9 and go to sleep? In a lot of ways, uh, externally, they appear to be tough. Their environment just in the school and around it is, is quite harsh compared to what I grew up in. They're drinking. You know, there's a lot of it going on around here because I have to pick up the empty bottles outside. And uh, once they get high, they do crazy things. You know, I mean, the kids live in the street, you know. It's almost like the movie Wild in the Streets. And, it, and it, they become very adept at playing a, you know, a game with police officers. As soon as the show was over, within a month, two girls in the cast were in court for to answer charges of assault and battery on a young young boy. Cliff uh, managed to lock his keys into his car one year and said to a group of the boys, um, do you think you could get in? And they said, sure. And within 30 seconds, they were in the car and had it, had it started. I haven't been down there really, except for the play, and I haven't been down there in two years. But like, when I was down there, everyone was really getting into group. be late to school so they don't go. They walk off and they go hang around in the corner. If it's a good day they go sit in the park or they go off and find two or three other friends. Or maybe they'll drop in for one or two classes they like and then they'll cut studies and cut something they don't like and uh, pretty soon they've got a lot of cuts built up against them and they're suspended. The other free time that seems to be spent in a, a little more constructive way is programs here at the school. The other children have after-school programs that, you know, involve them in arts and crafts, and working, and all that kind of thing. Um, the older kids, we've tried to set up programs like film. Uh, we have a potential proposal that's going to talk to uh, video programs and learning how to use video. A drama program for the teens that uh, Phillips Brooks and Harvard have helped us with a great deal. Because of the lack of any kind of structured use of time, we need a teen center in the area. Most of the other areas of Cambridge have teen centers. And people uh, have talked about needing a teen center for a long time. When I got here, I picked it up and found out that it was a very real need. I think a teen center would be a great thing for these kids. Um, a teen center away from Longfellow School, away from any school. In the ideal world, I think that a teen center would do tremendous things for the kids. It would give them a place to go, it would give them a place to unwind. Uh, it would give them a chance to, uh, to r blow off steam and not have to worry about uh, you know, being, being reprimanded for it. They have petitioned, I know that the Longfellow Ward has petitioned at least five times to Mayor Ackerman to either get a new building or get permission to use two of the downstairs rooms in the basement of Longfellow, which are not being used now. In January, the Cambridge Chronicle ran an article on the need for a teen center in the Longfellow community. The article was blunt and recounted the sort of trouble which the youth in the area were getting into. Ann Raver, the article's author, discusses the community's response to her account. And the thing that struck me about um, people's reactions to it was that they jump on the negative things um, because they really don't want to 
good enough then. I mean, the things I talked about, kids getting drunk, breaking windows, um, taking smoking grass, probably. Um, who knows? That, that seems to me to be a, a very natural thing among kids who don't have that much to do. The drive to get a teen center in the Longfellow, the Longfellow area of Cambridge is at a standstill right now. And in, at a time like this, shows like Bye Bye Birdie are very, very important, not only to the kids, but to the entire community. They give a sense of spirit to the area. There's, the kids are busy doing things, and the parents are busy being proud of the kids. And this is an important thing, because the parents don't have too much of an opportunity to be proud of the kids. For a lot of these kids, this was the first time they had a chance to have any kind of positive fun, and they loved it. And this is, and, and the reason you know they love it is because they keep coming back and they say, when's the next play, you know, even before the, the one we're doing is over. Now, Walt is, I think Walt is really easy to work with. Like, he's really patient. Like, I, you know, I goofed up a lot of times, and, you know, he never got upset or anything. It started off as a, as a big joke. No one thought that the program would come off. And, uh, and when these kids, all of whom had large police records and, and uh, you know, not very good school records, this sort of thing, put on the show, everyone was shocked. And I wasn't shocked. I knew that the kids had it in them. I, The show gave the kids an excuse to be together, to be to be natural, to uh, to have a common a common bond, the common experience of putting on a show, and, and and looking forward to the show when when we were a month away and things really began to get tense was a time that everybody really drew close. The point of it is that when a kid gets up there and finally does something right, we haven't done it, he has, and all of a sudden he feels that he's worth something. They had a chance to see what um, what a little bit of self-sacrifice can do in terms of giving you personal satisfactions. Very thrilling experience for kids who never had this this kind of positive thrill before. It was a it was very exciting. You could almost feel the excitement at every rehearsal. And when someone did something new, like like sang in tune for a change, or or knew their lines, or said something funny, then the, the entire group took pride in it. When something worked, you just felt this kind of, you felt, my God, you know, maybe these kids understand what we're saying. And then you thought, God, maybe they really like what they're doing. And then you thought, they're getting an audience reaction. Great, because that means they've got something to work from. was kind of a tomboy then. And I don't think that she'd ever had much of a chance to really be beautiful and really feel like she was worth very much, do you? And when after the show, we, the cast part, she looked beautiful. She had lipstick on and, and eyeshadow and very, very, um, very, very innocently lovely. And um, she felt so wonderful. She had to sing, someday I'm going to be a very fine lady. You just wait and see. And you know, and when she sang it, you almost felt like, you know, she was really singing about herself. And when we got to the cast party, everyone had a really great time. Remember, Kevin was doing imitations, and you were doing imitations, and it was a nice thing. And then when it was over, 
it was like a you know like gigantic weight was dropped out and uh, and Robin started to cry and she ran over to Kim and me and she she started uh, saying oh I don't want it to be over and crying crying and it made me feel really really tremendously fulfilled. They want them always to know that you love them. Oh, Cliff and Jeff, they, they're not just directors, like they, they, they're just like really great friends. Like you can, if you ever have a problem, that, I think that's why I'd really go to one of them. When I started, um, when I started my romance with Kim, who was a, a, a volunteer in the program, all the girls came over and said, oh, Cliff, do you like her, do you like her? You know, and, and they, were, they were looking up at me like, you know, like, like they were my, little, my kid sisters or kid brothers, and this is the way I'd want it, because they took that kind of an interest in me. You know, they didn't have to, they didn't have to draw the line between Cliff the director and Cliff the person. Yeah, he's a real good friend to us. Black just like a sign, you know, of our appreciation towards him for doing what he did. Ruthie came up to me, one of the little girls, and said, well, now she's not so little. I should watch that if they ever see this, you know, they, one of the young ladies. Um, and she said, you know, we wanted to get you something that if your house was ever on fire, it would be the first thing that you'd run in to get and save. And they were right. It's, it's by far my most prized possession. Like this guy, you know, Cliff, he just walks in, you know, all the kids, he got all the kids together and said, well, you want to do a play? The kid said, yeah, yeah.